Mesdames, Mesdemoiselles, Messieurs, je suis ravi de vous accueillir avec M. Nuitin. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to uh, receive you with the entire team of a team of speakers okay. English. for this meeting. We are very uh, fortunate to talk uh, with the Assembly of Podiatrician, European Podiatrician, and my friend who is sitting at the back represents the International Federation of Podiatricians, so somehow our American colleagues. I would like to thank the heads of the different schools and training institutes, all friends. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Chase, uh, who agreed to come and visit us today. Without further ado, I would like to talk about our friends that work on posture. But everything that we're going to talk about posture is not a personal uh, disagreement with you. It's just a matter of theory and background uh, theory. And of course, I will mention things about posture and the feeling we have about that. So I would like to have my first time, please. Could we dim the light? So, today, again, without, it, took, it took me 30 years to get to that level of knowledge, but I'm very humble, and so please, I'm just trying to share my knowledge. Today, the objective of myself and my author are to use, the, to, to, to study the food as a subject. We're not going to talk about food as a subject, but as, as a tool, a vector for action, which are aimed at the locomotor apparatus and try to treat the different musculoskeletal disorders. So we use the food to treat musculoskeletal disorders, and we try to have this complete overview, and our entire treatment is really aimed at the food with a view of having this general action at the body level. Treat Saying that food makes it possible for us to treat everything that has to do with osteoarthritis, but also by static and dynamic so posture and kinematic. And this is really the difference that we're going to talk about. So when we talk about static, it's the insole, it has to do with posture, and again, it, it, it does work with fundamental biomechanics. So static has to do with posture, the bipodal position, being stable, being uh, immobility and the stable posture, the fact that you do not move, despite the sort of oscillations that may be present, is stabilized by the muscle stability. Uh, Men and Laurent Chaise uh, uh, is dissimilar to that, are fascinated by movement and uh, they were very keen on trying to define what is mobility. So that was everything that has to do with static. What is dynamic? Dynamic is kinematic. We try to confuse posture and kinematic. So it's movement, it's a segment mobility with range of motion, body moving. It's people that it's a gait. And when you move, we in we, we, we have a permanent imbalance, an imbalance that we have to compensate for. And this uh, activity is based on a matter activity, which is not a partial activity once again. So as a matter of fact, we work on movement. Pugetry, as in matter of fact, is a dynamic discipline, as it were. And we're here to try and correct the segment mobility issues in order to rebalance those imbalances. And because of those imbalances, we do have issues. 
I would like to have the next slide, thanks, Mr. Speaker. We, here, we, we are just going to take an example from daily life. There are others. This is a pseudo forum with the femur uh, on the fixed image. So, on the fixed image, you see what is the disease. And there is an extension and an internal rotation of both limbs, which explain why there is a space in between both condyles. Uh, people are sometimes able to project towards a dynamic gate. Of course, it is open to discussion between what you have in static and what you have in dynamic. So this pseudo varum becomes a pseudo vulgum in function, in monopodal. So you have a difference between what you see on the static picture and what we see on the dynamic figure. And this explains the, the pattern of the moral uh, issues and the constraints for the femoral patella syndrome when you have a structural issue because it is in the three-dimensional of, of the space and there are major constraints on that knee and we shall talk about that later again. So the proximal thought the proximal food, the head is distal when, and the head is in the space. You have no resistance, which is plain that there is this food in interaction to the ground. So we can, can pretty easily from the proximal food, which benefits that it is supported by the floor with that proximal food. We can correct the uh, uh, segments that are mobile and are creating muscle. Contracture. So it's the fourth foot. The fourth foot is really what is of interest in the proximal foot. We could use it as the distal foot. It is definitely distal when the articulation center is at the hip level. Now, when you have your foot on the ground, it is proximal. What is the interest of the proximal foot? Because there are 10 metatarsophalangeal supports if you remove the 5-2, which is inefficient. So 10 supports on the ground when the talus is on the floor on the floor and is balanced by the muscles. So 10 points of support with twice as much muscle support than what you get, you have with the posterior talus on the, only with the heel support. So 45% of the gait cycle. So we should take advantage of that fundamental support because it's the moment when the forefoot is stabilized. So we should take advantage of that, uh, of that support because it does help in the balance of the muscle and the skeleton as well. You have here Vargas on this example and through the implementation of an anterior supinator, it's taking care of the heel part of the foot and it's going to help and prevent pronation of the forefoot. And you have here this contraption that is going to directly act as a support according to the axis of the leg. And it's extremely efficient. And of course, we will talk about this later. Studies have been conducted uh, between the slope of the anterior supinator and the height of the arch. So we're making impressions and all of this is, is really <coughs> defined by the slope in the impression taking device. So the slope <coughs> relates pronator uh, uh, supinator. You define the angle of uh, your contraption device that supports the arch. So everything starts from the forefoot. I'm sorry, I forgot something. So I would, I would like you. I would like to have the previous slide. I forgot to say something on that. So how come? Where are we interested in the proximal part of the proximal third triceps quadriceps? Uh, hamstring 
uh, all false muscles are triggered here by this falsehood. And so you, if you do act on that part, there is a mobilization of the entire muscle system and there is a rebalancing of the entire chain. Uh, so you have the external reaction chains. As a clinician, our major challenge is to make sure that the pathological external movements can be used for treatment purposes. So we often talk we often talk about uh, contact shocks, but we do not talk about waves of shock, and we realize that the, those waves are more deleterious than the contacts themselves. So here are the offenses that we design. Those are CMFOs, custom-made food offenses. The impression taking is monoportal when the food and the limb position are corrected. So we try to reproduce unilateral movement in guide, and this is taking into account the position of the arch. So it compacts, there is an angle that is quite harmonious, and it is characterized by devices that are going to uh, support the arch. 45% again of the gate cycle is here on the arch. No. How can you? Can we translate those external deleterious actions? Those are external uh, deleterious aspects. Laurent Chaise, 10 to 15 years ago, studied that very well, and Sébastien Delacroix demonstrated that very well. How can we translate those external forces as external? beneficial or external therapeutic forces. So we need to convert those uh, grand forces by mobilizing the dorsal part of the structure. So we need to uh, reorient the external forces. It's going to change the moments when the foot is on the ground. So it's a dynamic moment because it is a real-time treatment. And each step your patient takes is a therapeutic step. It is extremely efficient when there is this uh, movement and the quantity of steps that are being taken is going to increase the therapeutic effect. So you have the external angles. They go from here, this uh, pathological point, so this is a point where the body is balanced, and it's going to be translated as an inversion toward the medial side. And this point in blue is going to be the point on which the therapeutic forces are going to be applied, and they're going to replace the deleterious forces. So this is the way uh, of treatment functions here when the food is on the ground. We know that there is this interaction between the ground and the man through the uh, heel and the arch. And so it is both our subject but also treatment uh, device and the food becomes a treatment medium. So uh, I'm sorry. But but I have to again phrase all this background information, but that was really to create the backdrop for my presentation. Those are the curves of kinematic movement. In red, this is the pathological curve, which is superimposed in gray, the curve of uh, treatment by proprioceptive orthosis. And in blue, this is the correction by a biomechanical. Moment. Moment. So Il this is 
So you see if I'm the profile of the curves and I'm very similar. So on the top you have this red curve. This is the pathological curve with no office or no insole. In the grey one you have the proprioceptive insole. So it has exactly the same function as a, a regular insole. Uh, while in uh, blue you have the levine uh, or biomechanical insole. So it can't be disputed that there is a different impact. And we may open the discussion on that later. So we already said that the food is the biomechanical uh, way through which we walk, we Run. And so we are going to work on the chain as a whole once we have rebalanced uh, these imbalance in the third. We do see here the direction of the different segments when you compare the pathological segment and when it is correcting and it's going to have an impact on the entire muscle chain. Once again, we know how to treat the different pathologies from to the head, almost all of them, and there are some areas in which we do not manage to treat osteoarthritis uh, in the hip because there are false positives. So, next slide, please. No, I think this is a previous one. Next one. So we just said that it is impossible to treat the muscle without changing the kinetic function of the joint chain. This is an inversion, inversion chain, which translates by a widening, a self-widening, a triple extension. And you have a chain with a high power to translate the mechanical forces. This chain is defined by the rotation of the femur and the patella, and the knee. You, the knee is in varan, or pseudo varan, and in abduction and extension, you have once again this movement in the three dimensions of space, and you see the difference where the, when you have uh, everything is organized around those two uh, uh, joints. And the knee is strongly related to the hip and to the ankle. So at the hip level, you have this rotation going upwards, and you have this varan in the hip. On the iliac crest, there is a retroversion, and the sacrum is in confrontation. Therefore, we end up to a low doses with a reducing of constraints on the back. So there is a retroversion and a low doses, and I'm waiting for a response for you. Okay, can someone complement my yeah, sentence? Yeah. So, delordosis, and you have a contramutation. So, you know that the iliac crests are widened and the synthesis, the pubic synthesis is contracted. So, there is this translation of energy in the limb. While here, this is inflection, there is eversion, and the movement is dispersed. Energy is dispersed. So, there is a triple flexion, medial rotation, abduction of the knee, and flexion. And so, triple impact on the way this is supported. So, we have the uh, head of the head, which goes towards coxa valga, and contact is upwards and to the back. So, retroversion, and the uh, pelvis is moving to the front. So, it's this. And it's a sort of movement in the hip that you have in a delivery. The 
Iliac yeah. Cross. You see the movement here. And just as a remember, when you have the distortion of the, of the Iliac, of the iliac, you go to the inside, and the posterior iliac goes upwards to the back. So we and we could stop here because if we uh, because this is not a major topic of interest. You have to know that the joint chains in an inversion. Are working on the inversion uh, muscles and vice versa. So it's a way through which we can treat muscular skeletal diseases when we work on those chains. And we shall come back on that when we transfer from this tension. We've seen that on the electromyogram, as Mr. Scheer uh, yesterday. So you have this inversion of. The chain. We're going to take another example, a precise example, for it to be maybe clearer. Once again, we have a scientific approach of this biomechanical thesis, which could be passive from a muscular point of view. However, this is not the case because we change from balance to imbalance. And when you have an imbalance, you have to stabilize, and the sensory motor systems keep intervening in that. A balance in balance. This is a nibarum. You have the external deleterious forces that are going to create that virus, and they are stabilized by the antagonist muscles to those uh, hydrogenous forces. So you have a contraction, you have, it may be painful in that region, as is demonstrated here. Then there is a release, the tensions are removed on the antagonist muscles. So correction here, the external correction forces are lateral to the site. So what we're going to create, and we've seen that already, what we're going to create is remove the Partially remove the tensions, that is going to be agonist to the muscles that were hyper mobilized. So this is a uh, resting period, active resting period. There is a transfer of forces. They are put to rest to treat them, and then there is a tension in the opposite muscles. So the agonists become antagonist to correction. So you may tell me that the muscles in blue are, are covered, as it were, by the external action. That is true, because if they were not, we wouldn't have this active resting. We've seen that. But on the other hand, I'm going to show you and remind you that inversion, inversion is abduction, medial rotation, and also flexion. We've seen that on the frontal plane it can be reduced when there is a potential activity, but when there is a flexion in the knee by external forces, the knee is activated. And when you have medial rotation, TFL is also activated. So this idea that of thinking that the biomechanical insole or orthesis is sometimes passive is not demonstrated. When there is a transfer of muscle activity, you also have a transfer of the compressive forces exerted on the joint. Next slide, a few clinical cases that are limited. This is patella femoral pain syndrome. This is something, this is the way we treat it and whether we have been treating for the last 20 years or so. This is a specific patella femoral pain syndrome. The patella is projected to the inside. Why? Uh, well, usually it should be. It shouldn't be that way. So why is that? It is a pseudo valgum in relation with an anti-torsion and medial rotation. So there are two uh, constraints. The trochlea uh, is going to move that to the anterior, and the patella tendon is bringing the patella to the outside, plus excessive flexion in the knee. So this is what we start with. So this is without our forces. This is definitely a pathological uh, situation. This is medial rotation. The patella is here. And see how we project it. It's 
This is the way we project liberty. So the surgeons wouldn't treat it that way. We change the position of the trachea, and it's a recent during the patella. I'm a, no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. This is a varan structural varan. This is neosteotrisis. So this is without treatment and with treatment. So we are not in a situation where we can uh, correct such an osseo, <coughs> so such a joint deformation. However, what we can do is unlock the knee, and thanks to movement, we can correct the adjacent segment to osteoarthritis. So we're going to place both segments in the same axis. And what are we going to change here? We're not going to correct the few degrees of varum, or only a couple of degrees, as Sébastien de la Croix would say. But what we're going to do is uh, reorient the way the muscle actions act on that, and we're going to change the contact points. There is a study that is currently being conducted, a randomized study, which will demonstrate how this treatment is efficient. Second case, you have an osteotomy uh, that was performed here and that became unsuccessful. So you have a knee uh, prosthesis, but thanks to those therapeutic external uh, forces, we managed to delay or postpone the moment when you're going to need and change this uh, prosthesis. So when you have these orthoses that are going to strengthen this therapy, and it's an avenue for it a more conservative approach in case of knee osteoarthritis. Strutural varum treatment is easier than the treatment of valgum because varum uh, goes in the same way as the action of, uh, of, 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 of different mechanical forces while you are in the opposite direction. This is the same thing uh, on the dorsal side. Uh, as of today, we know uh, how to treat those acroralgia. Uh, However, I would like that we exchange our knowledge and our point of view. I know that in the United States, they tend to treat it surgically, while we, as, a, as an outpatient treatment, while we tend to treat it with orthosis. So you have arthrodesis of the lower segments, and those arthrodesis create a hypermyabolism of the upper segments. Uh, I remember here, uh, I remember that patient, Cruralgia. He was a patient that became very painful during the holidays. And uh, the, I received that patient in my practice. And we managed to rebalance the pathological disc. So it's not a matter of device uh, when those discs are. Um, fixed, it does help in the treatment. This is something, again, that we know how to treat for an extended period of time. This was a 1997 case. There was a mechanical disc, a car accident contracture, and there would be here this uh, pinching here, excess of constraint by compression and traction here. Then, after a few weeks of insult treatment, there you see this radiograph that was taken without an insult, and there is a memory of treatment which shows that we managed to align the vertebras so that there is a more homogeneous uh, breakdown of constraints. So I was rather quick. I had to do this quick overview. However, I'm ready to, um, well, I'm opening the discussion to you, and I would like to Thank you for your kind attention. Merci à vous.